All righty. Alejandra, hey, thank you so much. I'm I'm super psyched for this show. We've been kind of uh, texting and, and talking about some stuff. So I'm so excited to bring you on the podcast today and, and really connect on some of these topics. How are you today? Oh, I'm doing great, Joe. And thank you for inviting me here. I've listened to some episodes of yours and I'm really, really excited to be here and have this convo with you. Yeah, well, you are one of the first shows kind of since the rebrand and Mm -hmm. what I'm, you know, shifting away from or kind of trying, trying to step into is this like, is, is to kind of give this audience a little bit more empowerment or a little bit more sort of intuitive fuel, you know, because I think the world is, is changing around us like crazy. And I think people are also becoming in some way, I think half of us are kind of becoming more disconnected from our intuition and we're kind of like waiting for permission to do everything. And then the other half of us are kind of like Mm -hmm. sinking into it deeper and just kind of going with wherever we're supposed to be pushed and shoved. And so I wanted to take the show from, I guess, more of a fitness focus that kind of touched on some other stuff into some other stuff that includes fitness because it's all, it's all one thing really, you know, so Anyways, I think you're an amazing fit to kind of help us launch this new podcast of Intuitive Warrior because you're just, you're doing it. And I'm so excited to, to chat and uh, explore what you're working on. And, and I'd love to kind of kick off with just how you kind of trailblazed your way, you know, a little bit about your background and like mm-hmm. what made you the woman you are and kind of put you into the position that you're in today. Yeah, yeah. Well, lovely. I think this is definitely in line with the work that I do. So my name is Alejandra Hernandez. I am a women's career and leadership coach. And I actually, the company, my business name is Empower Her Change. So it was really with this this foundation and, and rooted in empowerment. How do we empower each other? And so I added at the end, I added the H to make it her, Empower Her Change. So I love that. And I definitely think it's in line. And um, in addition to that, I am also the co-founder of a corporate wellness company called Opti Wellbeing Solutions, where we provide corporate wellness solutions to companies to ensure that their employees can be healthier. So on those two ends, in terms of how I trailblazed my way here, I mean, so long of a story, but, you know, to kind of just hit the biggest points that I think molded my experience is I am a first generation American. My parents immigrated from Colombia and from a very small rural village as well from Colombia. And so growing up, I also grew up amongst many other first generation Americans. And so my world was always this like dual kind of space where I would spend summers in Colombia and my Spanish wasn't like great enough. And I was definitely like the gringa over there and the American every time I went there. And in America, I knew that I wasn't like this staple of what people see as an American. And it was really interesting to see this kind of like duality where it's like in America, I'm Colombian, but in Colombia, I'm American. And it's very, very interesting. So I think that developed a lot of just my upbringing, the way that I saw the world, because my perception was, you know, just dual in the way that I would see things. And also, like I mentioned, my my mom is from a very rural village in Colombia. So my family that still is there, most of them are poor. And so going to Colombia, I was able to see poverty in a very different way as well. So that shaped a lot of my life. And a lot of my life being first generation American was like figuring things out by simply failure, like just trial and error, trial and error, trial and error. I had no idea how to get to college. My mom had no idea how to get to college. And my, all of my friends were basically first gen, as I just mentioned. So we were like the blind leading the blind when it came to that. And a lot of that experience of being the first. It's why it's like this trailblazer in me. It's like, I'm always the first of something. And so I'm just walking through this like uncharted waters and I'm trying to find my way. And I think it really built a lot of resilience in me. It built a lot of in a way, there's this curiosity in me that's always like, but how could it work? Or like, how could it be? And I think that's really helped me in terms of entrepreneurship. And so I was able to really foster this resiliency in me. And throughout my career, I jumped around a lot, just trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I had no idea what I wanted to do. And I kept jumping around and jumping around until one day I finally decided, I was like, you know what, I'm done with hopping around. 
the common denominator in all these jobs is me. So I need to figure out <laughs> what the hell's going on. And I need to, I need to figure out who I am. And I was like 25, quit my job. I had a lease and everything. So I had to sublease it. And then I traveled for a bit. And then, you know, I, there are a lot of things happen in between, but I wound up in a career coaching role by like, I wasn't even looking for it. I thought I wanted to go into college admissions. And then I wound up at this company who had just started a career coaching department and needed some support there. So I just started to help out and it just completely like blew my mind away. I was like, this is so cool. And I loved it because I realized, you know, so many of us, when we talk about like intuitive warrior, a lot, especially when you're connected to your intuition, a lot of times we don't really see the gifts that we have because it can be so tapped in. It can be something that we've just learned throughout our life and we don't really see these great gifts that we have, these great strengths that we have because we're living it. And that was one of the things I realized was I had a really great strength for being able to listen to another person, bring all their thoughts together so that ramble could actually begin to make sense. And a lot of career strategies I had naturally by my trial and error process. Like I just had a, I had an, a, an ability to find jobs that I didn't realize was a gift until I became a career coach. And that's how I wound up in the career coaching department is like really just by this trial and error process and then decided to go off and do it on my own because I was getting tired of the kind of, I feel like it's a little bit about the way that you're rebranding is like, I was getting tired of just like these tactical things. Like, let me do your resume and let's do a mock interview. And you know, what are the strategic answers? Like these things are important, but I was realizing I was placing people in jobs and they didn't actually know themselves. They didn't actually really know if that's a job they wanted. They were just going through the motions the way I was going through the motions. And that's what ultimately led me to found Empower Change because I wanted to focus on who are you? How do I empower people to understand who they are, cultivate confidence and be leaders in the workplace, not just cycle them through to another job? And that's ultimately what led me to career coaching and Empower Change. Oh my gosh. I love, And I'm so fascinated lately about how our upbringings and our life and our experiences and our challenges like like are all there for us to to create change in the world right like it's mm -hmm. it's truly mind blowing and obviously you're no exception it's like that experience i want to dive into being a colombian in america or an american in in colombia it's like <laughs> because ultimately the hierarchy of human needs like we have to feel like we belong Mm -hmm. We have to mm -hmm. feel a sense of tribalism or a sense of belonging or a sense of community in order to be maximally healthy. And how interesting is it? And I'm sure you've seen this is like a lot of people jump from job to job and job. And it's like, mm -hmm. I was, I was a Colombian in an America, in America at that job. And then I was an America, American. I don't know why I can't mm -hmm. say American today. I was an American <laughs> in Colombia in that job. And then I was mm -hmm. back to being a Colombian in America over here. And it seems like there's a connection between what you went through in that sort of journey of trying to find yourself and define who you are. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's no question how you ended up helping people do this, right? Yeah, absolutely. And a part of that journey, I think is like being able to connect with this intuitive aspect that all of us have, but that oftentimes is suppressed in order to rely on the mind and logic, which has its place. But I just, I reached a point where I was like, again, there's something going on and logic isn't answering these questions. Trying to find the job with the higher salary isn't answering the question. And I really needed to take that break in order to go inward and figure out like, who am I and what do I enjoy? And why does that matter to me? And be able to reflect on my childhood experience and see how I can tie that in. And I think part of that whole process is being able to slow down as opposed to just going so fast that you're just switching, 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 and there's no actual progression happening. There's no cultivation of awareness and who you are. So a hundred percent, just being able to reflect on what my childhood was and making sense of these things and who I am now so that I can make decisions from a place that is grounded in my intuition and who I am, as opposed to what I think externally needs to happen. Right. And, and I think this will kind of bridge the gap too. You were talking about being the first and, and it is so interesting, right? Like, you know, we haven't, we haven't really talked about children, but you know, I, I don't believe you have children right now, but let's say you did in the mm -hmm. future and let's say they were, you know, those are, 
Americans, right? Those are our kids that were born in America and, and they've got it easy. And then, you know, prior to you, your parents were born. in So you are the first, you are this, this, you're carrying the weight of that. And I think the world even, you know, on a much grander scale is also going through a transition like that, where I think a generation or two in the future might have it a little easier then we're going to have it, you know, here in certain, in certain respects. So I just think it's, mm-hmm. you know, sort of, it's sort of that like fractal, you know, um, look at things and the way we uh, see our experience, our biology. And I find it interesting when there's, there's clues like that, like, okay, so on the small scale, you know, Alejandra went through this, but it's helping her with, the grander scale, which is potentially this, this role you're in and helping women step into their power as an example. So you're the first there as well. Am I making sense? Yeah. And I think one of the things that's coming up as you speak is this, one of the things I've talked about is every action has a consequence and even the action of not doing something that has a consequence. And when I am speaking to my clients or anyone, it's so important to really sink into that. And for anyone who is a first generation American, just even for me to think about the action of my mom coming from Colombia to the States, like pre-internet, like what is America? She has no idea. There's no pictures. You don't like Google about it and learn. You don't get to prepare yourself and learn the language before you go. Like you just go. And that action that she took completely transformed the lineage of her family. The way that we, the way that I live in comparison to all of my cousins is vastly different. And that is because I was born in this country. It's because I have an opportunity that they simply cannot even fathom. And so every action has a consequence. And I like to reel that in. And if you're not a first generation American, just think about something that has been incredibly impactful in your life. And it really, every action is there. And so when you think about that, like this action here could be something transformative and this action here could be something transformative. It really deepens you into an intention of how do I want to live my life? Wow. And, and thinking of the strength your mom had, you know, like what skills does she have or what strengths does she possess? <laughs> right. That- oh my gosh. Yeah. I love that question because like, you know, and some, some other of us can do this, even if we're not first generation, but like, I think about my mom and where she was at, at like 25 and I'm like, geez, like, how did she do that? How did, like, my mom came here, and I think the biggest strengths is, you know, tenacity, resiliency, um, community, being able to build community, because like you said, that is a basic human need, which is why you will find people who immigrate to the States will find people that are in their country or speak the same language, like, they'll, they'll make it happen, and it's because belonging is so important, so I think her being able to cultivate community, her resiliency, tenacity, um, her laughter, her ability to be so curious and love and laugh even in the midst of dark days, I think is a huge strength that she had to cultivate being in this country. But I think about like, dang, where she was versus where I am. It's such a, and they're just different, but because she had to almost in a way, you know, she had me at 21 and um, my biological father did not stick around. And so it was, and, and she was in a country where the language she did not understand and her occupation house cleaning. So just the, the sheer like circumstance of that and seeing like, whoa, that is incredible in a way where it's like, not that. I would want that for anyone, but just to be able to see how she, like what she had to push through, I think is really powerful for me to understand that there is a resiliency in me as well that I can always tap into. I I love that. And and it's, and it's so interesting because it's a, I think your mom must've had, you know, clearly like when she was coming here, she was, she was the first, right? So she was, clearly looking ahead to your adulthood, your, your, the generation that begins with you. So I think over the last, you know, our generation, my generation, I think there was like a a vacancy of having to think about the future truly. Right. Mm -hmm. So in other words, seeing yourself, what role am I playing in the future of this planet or the future generations of my lineage? And I don't think like, now that I have a son, like I think about that 10,000 
percent more than I used to. But I think mm-hmm. it's it's really interesting because I think a lot of people have never really had to think that way. I think mm-hmm. I think even say, you know, people and my parents, you know, of course they want what's best for their kids, but they don't really they aren't re- they know that as far as they're concerned in 1965, like they're mm-hmm. just Americans and they're just going to be Americans forever. So there's not mm-hmm. that same like your mom had to be selfless, like completely selfless is my guess. Like mm-hmm. she saw herself as I am the vehicle that's going to change the future of this, this lineage. Right. Do you, is yeah, that true? So I think what my mom saw was opportunity was the biggest yeah. thing that my mom saw. And I think for her, it was opportunity for herself and opportunity for her family, because it is very common for um, people who immigrate out of their country. If they are people coming from poor families, a lot of them have the intention to send money back to their families. And so my, my mom, I believe had this more opportunity and actually my sis, my mom, my mom's sister. So my aunt, she was the very first. And then my, my mom got the invitation to be able to come to the state because it's not just like you book a flight. It's not like Americans, nah. oh, let me go on Google flights and book yeah. my flight over to America. That's not how it works. And so she got the ability, the opportunity to come. And I think she came because she saw the opportunity. She saw just what people perceive as America outside of America, and especially in poor families, is opportunity, is is a dream, is something that I could be able to support my family in a much bigger way. So I think ultimately that's what she saw when she had me, again, at a young age. I think from there it was very much like, how do I create a life that is going to be of stability, that's going to provide for her? How do I get, at, like my mom bought a house and you know, it's not like she's making a lot of money, but she was able to like, she's very, very savvy in that way. And I think that was the biggest thing for her is like, how do I create stability structure for my family back home, but the family that I have here as well. Right. Yeah. And you can start to see, you know, so you're, you were, you had a single mom, right? There wasn't, there wasn't a father in the picture, correct? So I grew up with my mom after that. I mean, that was a long story, but yeah. So I did grow up with a father figure. Okay. And just not my biological father, but he is who I, you know, referred to as my dad. And they divorced when I was nine. So they, you know, divorced when I was nine. And then my mom wound up remarrying from there. So that actually, you know, once we go deeper into the conversation, just like how our upbringing impacts us so much, um, a lot of women especially have a lot of impact around men in their lives, especially if there was instability with the men in their lives, with fathers and things like that. Um, But yes, I had a father figure and it was just a bit tumultuous throughout my life life, kind of what that figure was, but I was fortunate enough to have a man at some point that did love and care for me. Yeah. I love that. I love that. But I can see, you know, again, back to the, you know, kind of strength in your mom, I can see you feeling like the American in Columbia and the Colombian America. And you're, I can see this, this women's empowerment leadership career coach in you. It's, it's just such a, a, a beautiful, like, you know, I'm just kind of stepping back like, oh my gosh, like how somebody in your shoes couldn't have a more perfect kind of backstory. So, <laughs> so I appreciate yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love it. So as we kind of look into the uh, broader picture and your role, uh, helping women kind of step into leadership roles and, you know, um, navigate their careers. Do you think that like right now women have, um, more needs for support in that area? In other words, over the last, you know, couple of years or the previous generation, why now? Like, why now am I, am I seeing you? And am I see am I seeing the, the, um, this industry, so to speak, you know, this, this, mm-hmm. I don't want to call it a feminine movement, but I think a, a, a shift towards, um, women in leadership and women mm-hmm. seeking support in their careers and things. And I think it's, it's probably more than years past. So why now? Like, why do women need this support right now? Yeah, I think a huge thing going on is we had um, a very large influx of women going into corporate America, let's say in the 80s, going into the 90s. And now what we have is a generation of women that are seeing the leadership that happened during that time, and that it's just simply not something that's sustainable or effective. And what I mean by that is a lot of the women that had to go into leadership in the 80s and 90s, I mean, that 
you had to be ruthless because they were the first. They were the first to get in there. They were the first to try to go and reach for the corner office. And that's where I think a lot of these um, stereotypes, which often have, you know, meeting, there's usually some kind of representation of it in order for it to come a, uh, become a stereotype where it's like that queen bee, like that women tearing each other down, this kind of like, I have to adopt masculinity in order to be able to reach success because that's the only way it looks. And so we have a generation now of women that are emerging. And I think they're seeing that's not how I want to do it. That's not like it's exhausting. It's burning me out. It's exhausting to constantly have to adopt something that I'm not. And I think that's why a lot of women are seeing this need now where they're just like, how do I enter into positions of leadership that are actually embracing who I am as opposed to trying to replicate something else? That's where I think we are. And that's why I do the work that I do so that I can support women in understanding what is their version of leadership look like that isn't a replication of something else that you think it needs to look like, but that you leverage your own abilities and your own strengths. Because we tend to have these different strengths in general. Men and women tend to have these varying strengths that oftentimes are complementary to each other. It's these this disagreement and not wanting to see it that way, wanting, wanting to see it as if you have to be the way I am and I have to be the way you are, which can create so much conflict in the workplace. But I think that's where the need is right now. People like women are, are seeing like, I want to get there, but not like that. Not if I have to like sacrifice my well-being, sacrifice my hormones, sacrifice having a child, sacri- you know, just so many different things uh, to sacrifice in order to be a leader in the workplace. And if you do do that, I think you also mentioned you're also robbing your potential and your impact, right? And and mm-hmm. this is a, a terrible example, but it comes up all the time because Amelia, my wife, as you know, she's you know predominantly vegan and plant based. And you know when we let me put it this way, when we used to go to these vegan restaurants in LA, and I would get like the burger, right? And it was like you know a beat between like, you know, some kind of bread with like a bunch of, you know, it was delicious. And I used to say to her all the time, like, this would be great, but why do they call it a cheeseburger? Why don't they just like, why don't they trailblaze? Why don't they call it like a a vegetable beet deluxe? Like, you know, don't call it the vegan burger because now I've had 10,000 burgers that are better than this, but in its own Mm in its own right, it's delicious, but like you're making me compare it to a cheeseburger. Right. Oh, and so I guess that I'm comp- is such a great point. <laughs> I guess I'm comparing men to cheeseburgers now, but yeah, <laughs> male leadership oh is basically a cheeseburger. right? <laughs> uh, oh my gosh. But you, you, I love that, like that metaphor of, you know, a woman, a woman stepping into like a male role and, and having to sort of assume certain thoughts, beliefs, actions, whatever, as opposed to just owning their femininity and what they are and what they bring to the table, because you're going to rob, you're inevitably going to lose some of the Mm -hmm. potential of a female leader if she's trying to fit into a masculine. Exactly. That's exactly, you hit it right then. It's like, that's exactly what it is. It's not adopting something else just because that has been the standard the whole time, because it really is just harmful to pretend to be something that you're not period no matter what that looks like for you to pretend to be something that you're not will eat away at you in some form or another it will show up energetically which will then manifest physically i promise you that over time it cannot sustain itself and so i think that's a really huge thing that you just touched on right there and the other thing as well is being able to see okay Now that I do want to be able to leverage my femininity in leadership, there is really, because this is new, a lot of women are struggling with that. A lot of women struggle with conflict in the workplace is a huge thing that women generally tend to like shy away from. They don't want anything to do with conflict. It's really difficult for them to be able to manage things like that for the most part. There's some women, you know, generally speaking. And so I think now what we're seeing is like, okay, if I want to do it my way, how do I do it my way when the leadership development space has been so centered on male leadership and males brains and the way that they operate. So I just think there's this gap right now where women are just figuring it out. They're like, I want to be able to 
be a leader, but I also want to be able to be me. And how do I leverage that when I have these struggles of, you know, avoiding conflict or direct feedback can be really difficult for some women because they're afraid of hurting people's feelings and things like that. So I think that's the space that we're in right now. We're kind of just, we're beginning that path finding way of like, what does feminine leadership look like? Right. No, I mean, that's, it's inevitably going to be a process, right? You know, like it's inevitable because it, it takes both sides, right? So there's this, you know, like you said, like if, if women are sort of more likely to, you know, avoid conflict maybe than, than a man, then that means also through conditioning, men are more accustomed to women avoiding conflict. Mm -hmm. Inevitably. Mm -hmm. So in the office, there's got to be this journey of, okay, so if, if, a, if, a, if a female leader steps in and doesn't avoid conflict, like she knows she's sort of maybe conditioned herself to, et cetera. So she's working on her empowerment. She's working. On, but the men also have to get used to this power, mm -hmm. right? So I think mm -hmm. what sort of like, you know, the yin and yang is still a circle. So- mm -hmm. What does the yang have to do as the yin starts to expand? Yeah, I think that's such a great question. Very curious. So one of the things too is like, there's such a beauty in both leadership styles. Like with men, what we've seen, you know, predominantly is like this ability to be very direct, get to the point. Let's make sure we get things done. What is the vision? This is how we work towards it. And being able to have discernment as well, like discipline, there's a structure, like masculine is very structure. Let's do this. This is the next item and let's keep going. Here's the vision. And women, like female leadership, you know, women tend to lean towards nurturing empathy, conversation, how are you doing? Really like caring about employees and what their well-being is like. Attention to detail, I may have mentioned. And that is so big too, because it's one of the biggest things is we can get too caught up in rushing through things and missing on really important things. And when you have this blend, you have someone who has attention to detail, who is nurturing and making sure that we're retaining our employees and we have directness and we have, you know, discernment. And so I think there is a beautiful blend in these two and not necessarily one versus the other. And so one, when I think about the yang, like I still, I really do see men as leaders. And I think it's important that we have more men playing a leadership role. What I mean by that is we have lots of guys in leadership roles, but the way that they're showing up is not in a powerful masculine way. It's oftentimes in a wounded way. It's oftentimes in an egotistical way. And what we need is really men that value what femininity brings and is also grounded in their masculinity. I ultimately think that is what's so important because men can still be very powerful leaders to women coming into the workplace. They've been in this space. They can be incredibly powerful leaders, understanding that the way they do it is not going to be the same. And that's okay. That's why I'm here. And I think that's the big role that men can play is being leaders, being able to provide some mentorship and guiding them into the space in their way and being able to support them when they are struggling with that directness, when they are struggling with maybe getting caught up too much in the detail. That's where perfection and perfectionism falls in. So I think that's the role that I play. I definitely think men are here to be leaders and can lead women as they bring in their femininity into the workplace as well in a much more grounded place. Gosh. Yes, I think you hit the nail on the head. And there's this, there's this, and I love some of these books that, um, um, like Warrior, Lover, King, Shaman, or I'll put it in the show notes. But there's there's yeah. a book about how like um, a lot of men, and, and when we look back at you know societies and men in general over the last like you know whatever millennia, the best example is the Spartans, right? Which I'm very you know, familiar with, I spent 10 years with a, with a Spartan helmet on pretty much. Uh, and <laughs> they, they would, they would rip sons away from their mothers at age seven and literally throw them into like a 10 year training camp. And that was like the most extreme, one of these sort of rites of passage of most societies in history. But the interesting thing is, is that like all of those practices were designed to take a, a man from a boy to a man. 
So they were designed to crush boy psychology and, and help them embody masculine, healthy, masculine, kingship, warrior, lover, mm -hmm step into that masculinity. And it's so interesting because as over the last say 100, 200 years, we've basically gotten rid of all rites of passage for men. Women have childbirth mm -hmm. and there's a few other, you know, things that we could consider definite rites of passage for women. But men have just become, I think part of what we call toxic mas masculinity is like, no, these are just immature boys in men's suits. You know, mm -hmm. these are, mm -hmm. are men that have never really gone through. And it's so interesting to just think about what you were saying in terms of like, when I asked about the male's role in response to a woman that is stepping into her power, if that man can't handle it, it's actually his own masculinity that he's in that he's potentially stuck in some of that boy psychology mm -hmm. where mom, you know, and, and every woman on the planet, if you're stuck in boy psychology is, is a version of your mother. And so the, I see it now. I can, I can see mm -hmm. this. It's really interesting that, uh, it's a good indicator for a man if he can't take advice or criticism or whatever from a woman, then there's an element of himself that he actually needs to investigate and figure out. Yeah, I think that's a really big thing. And so when we were, you know, sending each other messages, it was kind of like this wave of there's a lot of this new wave of a lot of, you know, men coaching men and women coaching women and what's going on with that. And I think a big piece has been this disconnection with a rites of passage and also this disconnection oftentimes with a cohesive culture with rituals, with, you know, things that have milestones that are embedded. And especially in a, in a country like America, which has so many different cultures, so many different languages, is that lack of cohesiveness can be a challenge actually in ways, not that it's bad, but just creates this challenge in which there isn't this rites of passage. This isn't, there isn't this like, this is how we do things. This is how it goes, or this is the tradition. And so I think that can create almost kind of like this loss of what is it, what does it mean for me to be, you know, a woman? And what does it mean for me to be a man? And in my case in particular, it was, you know, I didn't grow up with my grandparents because my grandparents are in Colombia. So I don't have, I didn't really have that multi-generational understanding either of like looking at my grandmother and seeing like, oh, that that's how she got into womanhood. And this is how my mom, like there was a disconnect for that with me. And so ultimately what I think is so important is being able to see the ways that women are, go they're entering womanhood and there are some trauma responses that a lot of women have. And that it, a lot of times that can show up as like hyper independence. Like I, mm -hmm. I don't need nobody. I'm good on my own. I, I can make money for whatever and all these different things. And when you do some digging, oftentimes it's really rooted in this trauma. It's rooted in abandonment, maybe from a man. It may be rooted from the lack of a father in the family, seeing their mother struggle tremendously and saying, I'm never going to be that person and associating men with being people who are unreliable. And so I think that's, there's this huge thing where it's just like, we've got to be able to heal the wounds that we have in order to be able to step into our femininity and on the other side, step into our masculinity in healthy ways because it does create this beautiful circle that can be so complementary to each other, but we're both showing up very wounded. One wants to be hyper independent. One wants nothing to like, doesn't want to listen to the other person because they don't value their, their input. And I think it's just causing so much drama where really there could be a lot of support for each other. Yeah, gosh, that makes total sense. And it's, do you think there's any other... So I love, you know, when we look at like the blue zones, like the Okinawans as an example, and, and, you know, vegans love to be like, oh, they eat mostly plants and they eat a ton of carbs. And, uh, but, but when we look at them closely, they have multi-generational, uh, kind of a hierarchy. There's multiple generations in the mm -hmm. same household. There's a lot of, mm -hmm. you know, as you mentioned, like a lot of social stuff going on, a lot of rites of passage, a lot of ritual and so when we try to figure out why they live a long time, like some people like to say it's the t tomatoes and potatoes and other people like to say, well, maybe it's this other thing. And it's, it's interesting to hear you speak and mention that you didn't have that, that, that second level of, of that grandparent. Right. 
And so do you feel like in our DNA from, you know, millennia of, of evolution, do we have these pockets or like, does our soul and our DNA expect there to be a grandparent? Mm -hmm. And if it's not there, you mentioned trauma, like, do we, do we find a surrogate? Do we, or do we internalize it? Like, do you think that there's like, our soul is looking for certain uh, role models and when they're not there, that kind of can either lead us to trauma or lead us astray. Yeah. I think it's really interesting. The question you ask, I think the big thing is being able to see that we are people that are social. And I think we learned that the hard way in many, in many ways over the past couple of years, but more importantly, especially in America, because again, there's such a different perspective in American culture than there is in other countries. And so in Colombia, a lot of the times there are intergenerational homes. It's very common. It's the way that most of them will live actually is in intergenerational homes. And when we look at America, oftentimes, so especially if you are maybe a first gen and your parents came here, but they left everyone else behind, you don't have that there. You have that breakage there. But then we also see that, for example, in other homes, which maybe are um, disconnected in other ways, like there isn't a father in the home. And in general, America tends to like family is really like the nuclear, meaning the mother, the father and the child. And when I see that, like, that's just not how it would be in my family in Colombia. Like it, there would always be someone there. Someone would come over. There is just the way that the house would look would be so much more different. And I think that's something that I'm grappling now as I do want to have kids just being able to see that like, wow, like I don't want to do this. Just like me, you like that. That <laughs> sounds like a lot. That's just crazy. So I think about that, but does it, does the, you ask, you know, do we yearn for that? And is there trauma in that? And I think what happens is we like, I don't necessarily feel like I ever yearned for my grandmother or my grandfather, but I also had no concept of that because like I said, a lot of the people that I lived with were also in that similar boat. And so I didn't even understand that that was a thing until I got older really and I met other people who had really close relations like people who'd lose their grandparents and would be devastated like I emotionally couldn't like empathize with that at first because I was like I don't understand because I lit I had like almost no relationship to my grandparents and so that's why I began to see that and I now I can begin to see the benefits that there are to having grandparents, to having other family members, to having community. But again, in the, in the context of also like, this is our culture and this is what we believe in. And these are our rites of passage. And this is our traditions. Like, I think there's something very, very special about having something like that because we all want to feel that belonging. And we all want to feel like, not that we can't ever explore who we are, but that we feel grounded in who we are. And when we don't, that can be a really difficult thing for a person to not know who they are. So I think that's the piece that's missing. And that's where the trauma comes in is just like not having this, not having a path, but just feeling lost, especially at a young age, not even knowing how to foster that. Gosh. So I'm going to take a stab at this. I'm starting to see, you know, what's coming through for me is this, when you were describing male versus female leadership and, you know, men, when you were describing male leadership, I was like, you know, in my mind, it was like binary, like men are like, <laughs> you know, like zero or one, zero or one, zero or one, zero or one, wait for the alarm, five o'clock, I go home, I drink a beer, I watch TV, I go to bed tomorrow, zero, one, zero, one. Mm -hmm. And then when you were talking about, you know, the way that women in leadership cultivate more energetic sort of, um, you know, gray, you know, mm -hmm. there's, it's mm -hmm. not just zeros and ones. It's like, you know, a male leader might not take a coworker to lunch because they think emotionally they need a break they might just say like you know smack yourself and get to work you know it's sort of like mm -hmm. this so when you were describing it uh as as you know feminine leadership being a, maybe a little bit more nurturing in some ways and male leadership being a little bit more you know in my opinion black and white and so that's mm -hmm. where this is kind of coming in where you know the gray and the black and the white all that's the yin and yang right mm-hmm and now as we're, as we're looking at this and, and this movement that you're a part of, 
it's interesting for me to hear what you're saying, because in many ways, the whole world has gone. If we look at like, you know, science as an example, people are trying to figure out, we look at the Okinawans and we want to know how many calories a day they eat. That would be the black and the white. That would be the masculine. Mm -hmm. That would be the the binary look at the Okinawans. What are the numbers? Mm -hmm. What are the numbers? How many calories do I need to eat? How many tomatoes do I need to eat? But when we look at the Okinawans, the reason they live a long time is actually the feminine. It -hmm. is actually the fact that they have this nurturing, this multi-generational, this this ritualistic. But that's all the stuff that's going away in today's Apollonian, the, the... the black binary, the science, the, the very black and white direction of the planet right now. Mm-hmm. So I find that interesting that just like a, yeah. f- a female stepping into a leadership role in an organization, well, this movement of feminine energy is coming into this, what's been a very binary and it's, and it's starting to run amok in my opinion, right? Yeah. The, the, the black and the white and yes, no to, to every question. Yeah. And I think part, that's why I do the work that I do so that we can have that nurturing so that we can have the feminine in the way that it comes in, as opposed to bringing in women who then replicate masculine energy, because there is a space for that nurturing. There is a space for that empathy. There is a space for that attention to detail. I mean, some people have brought up the crash that we had in 07, there were women that were attempting to ring the alarm. Like these things aren't looking right. The housing is it something ain't right. And no, and, but they didn't actually get heard. And so when we see like these, we can have this beautiful partnership, but when we have women replicating masculine energy, because they feel like that's what they have to do in order to survive, in order to succeed, in order to be recognized, in order to be respected for whatever the reason may be, if they replicate that one, it's usually very detrimental to the female body, to the, to the body that we have, because it's way more sensitive than the male body. And so we really jack up our hormones and our psyche when we attempt to always run on masculine energy. So that's thing one. But then it's also what a disservice because the greatness that women could bring into the workplace, that's what's really is missing. And 2020 was a huge disruptor in all aspects of life. And especially when we think, I wouldn't say especially, but in addition to the corporate world that recognized, oh, I guess we can't just treat our employees this way and expect them to stay. Because a lot of people said, bye, I'm not doing this not living my life like this anymore. And so now more than ever, we're seeing like employees want to feel like they matter. They want to feel like they're important. They want to feel like their opinion is valued. And this is a space where women can definitely come in and be of such support if they're grounded in who they are femininity in their femininity, as opposed to trying to replicate something. Right on. And I think I think one of the most important things right now, and, and this is a beautiful discussion, and it's and it's so funny because when I look out, I don't want to get into politics and stuff, but like when we look at the political landscape right now, um, like the divide, the division between people, it's it's funny because just real quick, it's like when I look at certain things, you know that this is like some sort of like, in other words, let me let me back up. If somebody wants to, you know, in today's society, if somebody wants to take on or head in one direction in one particular area, these days, it's like, that means it comes with all of the other elements of like that political parties, you know, so there's no gray like in politics today. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. you Mm -hmm. can't, if you, you know, with the, the happenings of the, of our modern world, like it's impossible to like have a certain opinion of Trump coexisting with a certain view on a different political um, mm-hmm. topic of conversation, right? So yeah. I think what's so beautiful about what we're talking about is because very quickly, as you start to expand into this area, you start to hit some of those topics of thought and feeling and emotion 
that in today's society take you away like a hot air balloon into a different political realm. So in other words, to heal the planet, I'm sorry if I'm rambling, but I'm trying to, I'm seeing this. We know that the feminine is here to, to in my opinion, heal the planet, right? Mm -hmm. I, we, I can talk more on that, but I think that this gray, this, this nurture, this nourishing energy is heal is here to heal. But right now people are so apart that they're afraid to step into the gray. They're either black or white. They're afraid to step into the gray in some areas, potentially maybe more men than women. We'll see. But I, I guess I'm telling listeners like it's okay to start to do that. And I know we're not directly yeah. tapping those, but I see that as you kind of expand into this gray area, that's where intuitive kind of power comes from and your ability to make a decision or to see something for what it is without all of the stuff that tends to come with it in today's society. And I'm sorry if I'm rambling and not making sense, but I'm seeing it. No, it, it came together towards the end. That's why I was like listening. I was like, he's going to get it. <laughs> well, but there's like, this, it came, came yeah. together. Uh, sorry, I'm seeing it, but it's very hard to put into yeah. words. But uh, and maybe I'll have to have my producer clip some of that. But you, you <laughs> see what I'm getting at, like yeah, I think a big thing as you were mentioning is like this gray. It's like yeah. understanding that there is a lot of grayness in the world, and that's okay. And the femininity can heal if it's grounded in mm. its femininity. It can't heal if it's attempting to be something else or if it's negating or denying that femininity. And so as an example, so that people can kind of see from my own experience how I saw this is you know, up until four years ago, you would never hear the words, I see myself as a mother, I want to have kids, like ever come out of my mouth. It was actually the opposite. It was literally the opposite. I never wanted to have kids. I had no interest in being a mother. I just didn't want to do it. And I had a day where I, we had, a, you know, we participated in some shrooms and it literally overnight in that day, I was like, I don't want to have kids because the only example of motherhood I've ever had in my life is one of suffering, of being poor, of being tired, of getting cheated on and staying for the kids. Why the hell would I ever want to have kids when that was my example for motherhood? I had a mother who worked her ass off, who was tired, who had to be the man, who had to be the woman, who had to do, just do everything. Why would I ever want to be that? And when I did shrooms that day, I was able to see it so clearly and see that I was operating out of this wounded place. I was denying myself of ever being a nurturer of my own children, of ever wanting to be someone who cared for another human being in that way, because I was so afraid of having to be this person that my mother had to be in order for us to be able to survive. And I see that so often. And so what I'm seeing is like this grayness is like being able to see that masculine is not bad. There's a lot. We need more healthy masculine. We need more men that are here with a vision, who are discerning, who have direct directness and where they're going and how they're going to make it happen. And we need women as well who are going to be really grounded in that nurturing, who are going to be empathetic, who are going to listen, who are going to be caring, who can also be able to support in whatever vision it is that we're pursuing. And so I think that's where this grayness is. It's not just this black or white thing. There's a lot of grayness and there's beauty in this grayness as well. I love that. I love that. And I think it's just, you know, that was probably such a gift for you having that experience. And I think generations before us, if a woman decided at 23, like, I just don't want to have kids, she might not have that realization until she's like 50, 58, that, mm -hmm. oh, <laughs> it was me that didn't want kids because doctor, damn, now, you know, <laughs> you know, and so I think we have this gift today that you're with your help, you're empowering people your focus is women to, to start to uncover some of this stuff and start to see mm -hmm. some of the why behind our actions. You know, why, why yeah. do you do the things you do? Which is yeah, core to getting into the right job, obviously. Like, 
Right. Absolutely. What, you know, why, what motivates you? Why do you do the things that you do? Why do you, you know, struggle to advocate for yourself? Why? And a lot of women as well that I've worked with struggle with male leadership, which is oftentimes the leader that they'll have will be a man. And it's usually rooted in some kind of experience they've had with a man in their upbringing, oftentimes father, but not always. Um, But just being able to see that like the leadership development space is has for a long time focused on issues and habits that oftentimes men have, but not women. And so it's like, how do we talk about leadership in a way that is supporting women in the kind of wounds that they have, the issues that they're facing specifically, so that they can step into a leadership role in a way that fulfills them, not necessarily one that is going to lead to a certain external thing they think they need to have. I love it. And how much of your uh, work, I imagine you give women permission a lot in different, in different, um, areas. And yeah, when, you know, when you were, when you were describing, I was thinking of Joe Dispenza has a book. It's one of his ones that's like pretty old now, but it's like breaking the habit of being yourself. And so Mm. like, how often do you like, cause I imagine you give women permission a lot and I imagine you give them permission to either continue to be their themselves or permission to not not be Mm -hmm. themselves. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Like, Mm -hmm. yeah, oftentimes, it's so funny, because it is like, oftentimes, it's, and you know, I live in the gray. And so a lot of times, um, I always think it's funny, because I am a career coach, a lot of my clients who come to me, I'm oftentimes their first coach. So it's interesting, because a lot of them are coming from the corporate space. I have some women who are maybe going into their own coaching business, or are considering doing like some consulting or freelancing, and some of them will come to me. But the vast majority are people in the corporate space and I'm their first coach. And so it's interesting because they oftentimes live in a very black and white. And a lot of times it's like their first, I wouldn't say first, but a lot of them it's intro to really this personal development, this reconnection with intuition. And so it is being able to point out certain things and just ask, well, where did that begin? Where did you get that idea of who you are? And is that something you want to keep on? And like the idea of even letting it go is something like new to them. Like, I could just not do that. Yeah, you could. And so we do a lot of that. But the other thing too, when we talk about the intuitive warrior, it's really interesting since I am usually their first coach, they'll ask me like, well, what's your advice, Alejandra? Well, what do you think I should do? Well, what do you recommend? And it's so interesting because from there, it's always... Uh, you're not going to get the kind of answer out of me that you're looking for because what you're looking for is black or white. So what I always do is I help them tap in. I give them questions to reflect on. I give them questions to answer right then and there in the moment based on where they are intuitively and just tapping into that so that they can begin to practice that and foster that. Like, what does it mean for me to answer my own questions? What does it mean for me to tap into what feels right for me? And that is a practice oftentimes very new to the clients that I get. It's just being permission to be who you are or being permission to shed that person of who you were so that you can step into the person you know you are. You just got some crap layered on there. You just got to clean it up a little bit. So we do a lot of that. A lot of that work is really allowing them to go inward and practice that. What does it mean to always be able to ask inward as opposed to asking you for the answer? Because I don't feel like I have the answer. And it's such something that's drilled oftentimes from school, going through college, going through, you know, corporate. It's like, what are you being told? What are you being instructed? What's your homework? Complete it. Next thing, just funneling through. So a lot of times to get to coaching, it's this brand new practice of like, oh, I'm just not going to follow, I, you know, I give direction, I give homework, I give assignments, but I'm, that's not all I'm doing. I'm like, no, there's a lot of things that you're cultivating within you so that whenever you move on, you have tools that are going to go way beyond our coaching sessions. I love that. I love that. And I think it's so interesting because so often coaching is just more of the same, right? So in other words, like you at work, you know, you, you know, you're not doing what you want to do to, to fulfill your person, passion or purpose. You're doing what you need to do to get the job and to get the, to get the raise mm-hmm. and to hit the numbers and to, you know, hit certain metrics. And then I think sometimes people then sign up to have a coach and, and they, they want more of the same, right? They, they want black mm-hmm. and white to fill in the gaps in the black and white at work. 
And, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and if, even from my experience, like, Hey, like if you want one of those, like I, I can help you find one, but that it's not like, <laughs> you know, it's not it. And so I love this, like, you know, this gray and, and stepping into that, um, especially from a coaching perspective and, and throwing their own questions back at them. I think it's, it's so often we are conditioned to, even in like a, in a psychiatry appointment, like people are still trying to just impress the psychiatrist, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. you know my, myself wow. included. Yeah. I remember, um, <laughs> it's, it's like you are, it's like this, this thing we're so addicted to. So as a coach, how do you deal with that? Like if someone comes in and you know, they're like a black and white, they're conditioned, they're so in that space that they don't even know how to step into the gray, like at all, but they're hiring you because they're like, I think she might have it, but they're going to fight mm -hmm. you on it. I, I imagine there's like, it's a challenge. How yeah, do you like set so the stage? Yeah, so a few things. Yeah. Right. That's such a great, great point. Right. So I think one of the things is this is why being you is so important and showing up as you in your version of that way is so important because the people that you attract will be very much in line with who you are. Mm -hmm. And um, oftentimes, like I struggled with this in the beginning as a coach or beginning as whatever it, it may be, like we're talking about women in leadership as well. It's like we're trying to just look externally and see what can we replicate? What can we be or what needs to get done as opposed to like, how do I desire to do this? So what I will say is like showing up as me, first of all, does a whole lot to be able to deter any of that to even begin with is just showing up as me because people know who I am. They get a sense for who I am and they're coming to me usually because they are most of the women that come to me have been in their careers for about 10, 12 years. And they've just reached that point where they're like, this isn't for me. And I need to figure out what is for me. I need to figure out who I am. I need to figure out how I can feel confident in myself. And when they're at that place, they are usually already like open. I'm here. I'm here to listen. I'm here to get coached and not to say, you know, I don't have clients that struggle with that. Absolutely. But I will say me showing up in who I am and being very clear about who I speak to has deterred a lot of that. In the beginning, it wasn't very much like that. I was getting a lot of people who were very black and white, but that's because I was adopting that too. I was struggling with like, who, what is my voice? Who am I? How do I show up? How do I speak based on the other people in the career development space? And I had, I began to encounter a lot of that and I had to really work through my stuff and be able to see like who am I speaking to really and that's where things began to change the people that I began to attract were like women that have just had enough and are ready they are ready for a change they're ready to make a difference they're ready to feel confident in who they are and I will have some that struggle a bit but they're so open to being coached the women that work with me are very open to being coached and when they are struggling and we're going back and forth i always read them and i always know where i'm pushing and where their limit is and then it's like here are some things to work on i i'm seeing some resistance here let's just do some of this we'll work on some of that so i always read where they are but i don't struggle too much in having someone who just straight up is it's like a battle every time we have a session. I don't really run across that anymore, but I did in the beginning. And I have worked, I have found, I've worked with a few men throughout my coaching um, sessions in the past. And I've noticed two things. One, the men who do come to me oftentimes are leaning into that femininity and actually for them, it's super interesting because it's like what they could use is actually a bit more of that structure in place. Mm. And then the other thing, too, is I notice that with men, they struggle a lot more with understanding their emotions. And it's very interesting because when I work with women, I'm like, how are you feeling? Not to say that there isn't any struggle there, but oftentimes women can talk a lot more about how they're feeling in a way that's actually addressing how they're feeling. <laughs> when I talk to men and I ask them how they're feeling, it's like, it's real. it's like um, no emotions actually came out. It's just like, it's almost like they're stumped. It's like very interesting to see that aspect as well. Um, so yeah, that actually was a ramble, but yeah. <laughs> you, you can't ask I a cheeseburger how it's feeling. <laughs> no. 
Exactly. It's so funny. Um, but that, that would be the big thing is a lot of people who are in the black and white, by the time they get to me, they're, they're ready for some gray. They're ready to like get some coaching and make some transformation. Step into it. I love it. What would you tell somebody that's like hearing this and they're like, oh my gosh, I think I'm going to hire her. What would you, what do you wish that somebody would do in like the week or two prior to calling you? Like what would be the homework you would give them in advance? Yeah, I think the homework to give in advance is be able to just ask yourself right now, what do I desire to do in my life? Not like what your current situation is, not like, you know, any of these things, just like, what do you desire to feel and be in your life right now. And sometimes at the beginning, that's so hard that sometimes it's just the not things. Like I don't want to feel sad all the time. I don't want to feel anxious. I don't want to keep suppressing my voice in meetings when I know I have something to say, but I'm so terrified that I will look stupid that I never say anything. I would first start with that. It's like, what do I desire to create in my life? And if it's super vague, that's totally fine. Coaches are part of, you know, we guide, we help you, we guide you. I always say you have the answers within you. And then I would ask you, like, are you ready to be supported? Like, are you truly ready to be supported in that process and be real with yourself? Or do you want to just figure it out on your own? Do you want to see if you can do it on your own? Do you want to see if you'll change, make a change on your own? And if you do, that's totally fine. But just really ask yourself, like, are you ready to be supported? And are you ready to be held accountable? And are you ready to make those changes? Because if the answer to those are yes, then 100%. Go and book a call with me and we can have a conversation. And even in the consult, we can dig into a little bit more of that as well. Like, are you really ready? And what is it that, you know, I go on my consult, I actually go through um, different areas of your life to really begin to build some clarity on it as well. But I would say that's the biggest thing. um, Because like I said, most of the people that work with me haven't had a coach, some had, but just begin to see like, am I ready to be supported in that way? And if you are, then yeah, be open up that space to have that support and to create changes that often oftentimes with guidance and with support can happen in a much faster way than you figuring it out on on your own. And I know it because I figured out a lot of things on my own and it was very messy and it was very long. (laughs) So that's why I I always lead with that. I love that. And I I think I mentioned this on a recent show too, but it, I remember I was doing this meditation like program thing. And um, like one day we did a meditation where it was like, I'm not, you know, I'm not my foot. I'm not my knee. Mm. I'm not. And it was like, I'm not, I'm not. And it got to like, I'm not the world. I'm not the universe. I'm not the moon. And all you are is you. Right. And then literally like a few days later, we did the exact opposite. Like I am my hip. I am Mm. my knee. I am my ankle. I am my toe. I am my computer. I am this house. I am. And I just think it's funny because they both get you to the same place. Ironically, that being nothing and everything is the same. And so it was when you, when you were saying that some people start with like, well, I don't want to be sad. Well, I don't Mm want to be, you know, I don't, I don't want to feel this way. It's like, that's an okay place to start. It'll actually get you to potentially a similar destination. Yeah. And something someone said that at first I resisted, but then I began to really understand what they were saying is a plan is better than no plan. And at first I was like, "Mm." But then when I really sat with it, I was like, I mean, I've gotten to my to like where I am out of having a plan that did not come to fruition at all. But having that plan put me in a mindset of like, okay, this is what I've got to do. I've got to put in some hours to work this. I've got to create some structure. I've got to make sure I'm taking care of myself so I don't burn myself out. And that path led me to something else. Not what I planned, but it led me to something else that was also great and also for me to experience. So I love that saying now that I think about it, I'm like, a plan is better than no plan. If you're starting with what you don't want to be, all right, just start there and you're, you'll are you begin to build the picture a little bit by a little bit by a little bit. And I had one client recently actually who um, we had a session and one of the things she referenced back to is on our consult, she was like, I remember on our consult, you told me that I, that you would guide me to the answers within me. And I just remember saying like, the answers within me? 
what does that mean? I don't have no answers within me. And then she, <laughs> she realized in that moment, she's like, I do have the answers within me. You were right. And she was just lighting up and I'm lighting up just remembering her saying it because it, it's one thing to understand something conceptually. It's one thing to understand that eating McDonald's is bad. It's one thing to understand that being on TikTok for five hours is bad. It's one thing to understand that the, the answers are within you, but it's a completely other thing to truly believe it and live it and experience it. Like once you experience what it means to like, oh, I, I am, I have an intuition. Like I can begin to foster that. I can begin to listen to that. That's a whole different ball game than just knowing. Yeah. Everyone's intuitive. Everyone, you know, there's, it's always such a different experience. Absolutely. And it's the, you know, I think sometimes it's the depth, um, of understanding, right. You know, I, I, posted on Instagram recently, like my recommendations in 2014, my recommendations in 2022. And it was basically like the same, <laughs> like the same four or five things. Oh, but I remember. In, uh -huh. in 2004, there wasn't like depth. It was like, mm -hmm. drink water, you know, and now <laughs> I could do a seven hour podcast on water. Right. And so there's just, oh it's depth, gosh, yeah. but the, the plan doesn't have to change. But I, an element I wanted to kind of also have bring up with you, Alejandra is, you know, like in, in, um, like 1996, right? That was like the famous year that um, there was like all these accidents on Everest. And mm -hmm. like all these mountain climbers, they get like summit fever. Like I see the summit, it's there. I've been training, you know, since I was a fetus for this day and, you know, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to, I'm going to go for it. And then they end up dying. Right. So there's mm -hmm. this, you know, this like, a plan is better than no plan, but like what steps do we need to take to like assess the plan along the way and know when the plan isn't the plan anymore. It was the plan that got us to oh, the yeah. new plan. Yeah. And oh, sometimes so, the new plan so is big. to like, yeah, the new plan is to stop at base camp, take a left, go home. <laughs> yeah. A hundred percent. That's such a great, I mean, that has, you know, two different concepts that I think need to be highlighted. One you just laid out, which is being able to reevaluate where you are consistently. Where am I right now? Am I on the right track? How do I feel right now? Because even if that was the plan, have the flexibility that that plan will change instead of getting stuck and like, I have to do this. And now you're ignoring your intuitive yells because you're like, but this is the plan. And it's being able to always reconnect with yourself so that you can always guide yourself through as opposed to getting stuck in the mind of how things need to look. So that's the first thing. And I think the second thing that goes into that conversation is is sustainability. It's being able to start a journey and know that there's got to be sustainability to this. I've got to be able to work in a way where I'm honoring myself, where I am putting in work, but I'm also honoring myself. I'm getting my rest. And especially when I talk to women that overwork themselves and I am I've been one, so I know it's like this very detrimental to ourselves. We will not last long in any role where we feel like we're overworking ourselves. So with Mount Everest, it's like that sustainability. Like, yeah, I see the summit. I see it over there. And I've got to make sure that I get there and I get back in a safe whole piece. You know, how can I do that? How can I have a plan that ensures that I'm going to be cared for and I'm also going to go after my goals? Both of them can coexist. Yeah, I love it. I love it. And and it's um it's so interesting. And and when you were mentioning like the self-care elements and the balance and the not overworking, it's so interesting because sometimes it's like when people finally reach out to the coach, it's like they're they're 12 years in to overworking themselves. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. it's like, yo, there's like, you know, there's some stuff to do before the plan, before we can believe the plans, the plan, like we got to make a couple yeah. of plans to, to, to get you from, you know, <laughs> you know, to, to get you from like the overwork, the stressed. Cause if we're stressed, we're not going to make the right plan. You know, if we're yeah. underslept, if we haven't had, you know, whatever, a massage in a while, whatever it is, so there's this, like, we have to get ourselves a little fertile before we're like able to plant the seeds that we, that we hope that we're going to plant. Yeah. And I mean, I'll say a lot of my clients that come to me on like the first console or, you know, when we start every coaching package that I have, I'll always start with like setting goals, like what, you know, accomplishing 
wrapping up this mastermind, wrapping up this coaching package, what would be the three goals you wish to achieve? Three goals you wish to achieve with this, that with the work that we're doing. And with that being said, it's so important to one, check in on that goal as well, like as we're going along to make sure we're working towards that as well. But the other thing is just being able to recognize that a lot of times my clients come to me and they have these goals and these plans. And I'm, I've always got to be like, that is not happening yet. You know, like, it's like this idea that I've got to be in another job and that job is the job for me in 90 days. And I'm like, "Mm, let me go ahead and rewind because right now you don't even feel secure in who you are and speaking up. So there's a lot of things that we probably need to address before we go into what is an appropriate career, what is a fulfilling career. So I agree in that way. It's like a lot of times as a coach is really being able to support our clients and being able to see what needs to get worked on because it's this process of slowing down. You've got to be, most people need to slow down. Very few people that I work with need to speed up. (laughs) sometimes but most of the time I'm working with very ambitious women and it's like you've got to slow down you speeding up is what got you here so let's slow down and let's create this plan here let's create some clarity let's cultivate some clarity in your vision and your values so that we can speed up in the future and we can make sure that you get to the place but a lot of times they come with a plan and it's not really the plan it's one of those things where it's like okay I see I see why you think that's the plan but let me tell you what we've got to do in order for you to be able to get there yeah, I, I love how human beings like the more afraid, anxious, scared, and unsettled we are, the faster we move. Mm-hmm. Oh my god! <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. It's like <gasps> I don't know where I'm going, so I need to go faster. <laughs> it's like, no, what? I'm lost. <laughs> <laughs> run faster like oh my god it is hilarious because like yes it is like the human brain that does that it's like i need to go faster it's like no there's and it and it gets back into that like there are so many and this kind of ties into like a lot of what we're talking about here in terms of like the 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 human being or the dna strand or the evolution it's like back in the day the only thing that would stress us out was like the lion in the jungle and so we developed a tendency to speed up when we're scared, but now it's like, I'm scared of like myself, you know, and you know, it's like, (laughs) so so I just like, you know, jump from, from, you know, people from job to job to job or, or whatever. It's, um, it's, it's, yeah, it's pretty wild. I've actually never thought about it like that. That's actually really fascinating to think like, yeah, when we were scared, we had to run or we had to be like just quick and run and be speedy. That's really interesting. I've actually never thought about it like that. And it makes a lot of sense in terms of why we feel like we've got to keep going, keep going, keep going, because I, that's definitely a huge thing that I see not only within myself as an entrepreneur, but also in my clients who, when they are scared, they just want to make things go faster and it's going, slowing down just feels like actually painful. It feels like so infuriating and frustrating and scarier to just, just slow down. And yeah, a lot of times it's just like, I'm just afraid of seeking truth. I'm just afraid of, you know, what if the, what if it's something completely scarier for me than I could ever imagine? So yeah, it's such an interesting way to, to be able to see that. I had never thought about it like that. Well, buckle up. How about this? The more scared you are, the more masculine leadership is effective. Mm. So if I'm running from a lion, I'm not, I need black, white, like left or right, bro. Like, you know, 100%. Um, and if I'm running from a lion and someone's like, my feelings are hurt. It's, <laughs> right. And so we've gone this, yeah. like, this is the sort of thing that's run amok is like our own, mm. our own evolution combined with like years of like, all sorts of, you know, lacks and all sorts of trauma and all sorts of like, you know, uh, unprocessed emotion 
Yeah. It's like a slip. That's where we are now. That's how we got here. Mm. And I'll share something with you. I wasn't going to share. I just identified this because you you mentioned the other day or you the other day, you mentioned the other minute um, about how you kind of help people, people kind of like kind of kind of like share what they're doing and you can help them sort of like here are the blue dots from what you just said. Here mm-hmm. are the here are the pieces mm-hmm. of the puzzle that are going to kind of contribute. And it's so interesting because I did this recently with somebody um, just paid them to sit there for three hours while I talked. And it was like, oh my gosh, like I created, so Runga is a very feminine brand. It's a very feminine, mm-hmm. I don't know if you agree, you've attended. Um, yeah. I mean, it's very nourishing, right? It's a, a place where, you know, you are really there to fill up, to be nourished, uh, to, yeah, I definitely agree with you. I definitely think there's, yeah, go ahead. There's a, I mean, we swing kettlebell. It's not like it's, yeah. but it, I mean, if we're talking like, you know, 51% feminine, 49% Matt, it's a little bit more on the feminine side and heading yeah. that direction. Mm-hmm. And it's so funny because when I created it, I was in Spartan, run through mud, throw a spear. Oh so wow. I created what I needed. I needed oh, what? Like wow. a community where I didn't have to throw a spear. I needed a community where I could have emotions. I needed a community that, mm-hmm. uh, you know, just didn't give a shit about like, all that stuff. And where so I, I created the gray care of. where I feel taken care of. Wow. I created the gray and now here it is. And now I gave up black and white. It's really interesting. Oh my gosh. That's a huge, huge thing. And that actually like feeds into what pops up for me. It's like a lot of women do that. Like they are missing so much of that father that actual and even if they do have a father missing that actual like masculine structure with discipline and discernment and protection that they then bring that in another way sometimes they adopt it or sometimes they find something in another man but it oftentimes can be wounded or toxic and that's where you wind up with a lot of women getting with very toxic men and so I'm see just like that actually really helped me as well in being able to see how women do that in their own lives it's like adopting this masculine thing within them and usually sustainably doesn't last a very long time uh, because what they, I actually won't go down that rabbit hole, but just, yeah, I can see how we want to be able to create what it is that is missing in, in our lives, whether that's externally or whether it's internally within us. I mean, it's like, so we all need the whole yin and yang. We all need the whole piece. We all need the whole pie. And like, if I felt I was missing pieces, well, what did I do? Well, Hey, I'm going to take a break every year and I'm just going to create that thing I need, you know? And so we all do that. And I think it's an interesting exercise we just came up with like, okay, like, what are you missing? Where where are you creating it? Where are you looking for it? And I think that's where, you know, I think a lot of times, just like you mentioned your experience when you kind of like step back um, and, and kind of saw the game around becoming a parent and saw how you viewed it and how, you know, that whole thing. And I think that's where people realize, uh, let me tell you this, Ram Das, I've listened to like 180 hours of his like podcast uh, or the people that are creating podcasts out of his recordings. And he said, you know, there was a violinist that came up to him in the seventies and he was like, should I take LSD to become a better uh, violinist? And Ram Das was like, it depends why you play the violin. <laughs> mm, oh my gosh. Oh yeah. You might quit. <laughs> Yeah. Um, Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And what I find too, it's interesting because another thing that I've come across, and I wouldn't say in the majority of my clients, I would just say in a, in a few of them, and I've actually experienced this myself. So it's interesting to see how I attract some women who experience this wound as well, but it's the wound around being creative. Some of the women that I've worked with feel like whenever I ask them, like, do you, I don't like, would you say that you're creative? Like you can tell that there's this immediate, like, uh, like discomfort, like just immediately wanting to deflect it. And I think it's really interesting because a lot of times when we think about creativity and if, you know, you follow the chakras or anything along that, when we think creativity, we're oftentimes thinking about sexual energy. We're talking about this ability to create, whether it's create life or create projects or create events or create a table, but this ability to have a vision and to then create it. And it's really interesting to see some ways 
ways that women have this wound around what it means to be creative and their ability to be creative. Because oftentimes I see it's in much more like timid women that are afraid of expressing themselves in multitude of ways. And that shows up in relationships, but also in the workplace. So that's something that I've uh, walked through with some of my clients. And again, like I mentioned, something I also experienced for myself is just being able to see the way that something is being suppressed, like this creativity, when really we all have the ability to create. So we are all creators here. I think that's another piece too, is being able to see where that wound comes from. Like if anyone feels like they're not creative, digging into where that idea comes from, because it's usually something within the life span in which something happened that created this suppression of creativity. Right. And I think of creativity, like, you know, it's kind of like sex hormones, like you mentioned, like it's associated with creation, birth, fertility. Um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, no, just like when you're stressed, like if your cortisol is high, then your, your benefit, your testosterone, if you're a man drops. So there's like these, Mm -hmm. you know, um, hormones are on these sort of like teeter totters. And it's like, if you're not feeling creative, well, the opposite of creation would be like striving for a certain outcome, per- perhaps. Mm. So striving mm. energy is almost like cortisol, almost like fight or flight. And then you have creativity mm. that's like going to have to go down if I'm in my striving self, just like if I'm running from the lion and someone's like, you want to color a picture? It's like, <laughs> no, <laughs> put, the, put the paints away. I'm like, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Great point. Great point. So there's this like ebb and flow. I think sometimes like the thing we want, just like a hormone, it's like the thing we want is actually hampered by the the way that we're spending our time or energy, thoughts, feelings, and doings, right? It's like we're squandering. That's interesting. So tell me about this mastermind you've got coming up. I know we're, um, we're in April now. We're going to flip this show quick. And I think you're starting in May. So, so Alejandra, tell, tell us yeah. what, what you got, what you're working on, what you're cooking up for us. Oh my gosh. Yes. So I'm so excited about this project. I am launching a mastermind in May. It actually starts Tuesday, May 17th is going to be the launch of it. And what it is, is it's a container, a mastermind for 10 women coming together. And it's 10 women with the goal of really stepping into leadership. So a lot of the women that encounter my space, it's going to be women that have, again, been in their careers for a certain amount of time, but they recognize that they're really struggling with this confidence piece, this ability to speak up, or, you know, some women have experienced corporate trauma. And so being able to step into leadership in the way that they know they want to be, the the leader that they know they want to be in the workplace. And it's also open for people who are interested in maybe starting a business who want to step into leadership in that way. 10 women ready to step into leadership. Really, this is all about cultivating community. Masterminds are really a phenomenal place where you can practice your leadership because it's about being able to have collaboration. It's about everyone being a piece of this and everyone contributing. And I think that's a really important piece for women that are interested in taking into that leadership. A lot of them struggle with just voicing their opinion in the workplace. Some women, this is a side note, some women are actually very, very strong in voicing their opinions at home with like their partner or with, um, you know, maybe their mother or something like that, but struggle immensely in the workplace. And I think it's really interesting. So all to say, 10 women starting May 17th. It's going to be a six month container. We'll be meeting bi-weekly. I will be leading the calls. And on there, of course, there will be collaboration on that. Every woman is going to be paired with another woman. So there will be a pair and that is going to be your accountability partner. And so that is really designed for y'all to begin to practice. What does leadership mean? What happens when Joe and I scheduled a call and Joe doesn't show up to the call. Do I throw a tantrum? Do I say he's rude? Do I say he doesn't care about my time? Or do I become a leader and set up a time and actually 
res resolve this thing that came up. And so this is a, a pr this is really a space when I think about like the Spartan race, I'm like, this is a space where we practice what it means to be a leader. When we practice what it means to say what we mean, to clarify our values, to create vision, to support each other. And so a lot of um, the women that I imagine also coming in are going to be women that identify as being trailblazers, whether that's because you're first generation American, the first to graduate college, the first to enter corporate America, the first to break these generational patterns that you've seen, whether it's alcoholism in your family, like the first to really, to really say it stops with me, it ends here. This is the place for you. So that's the mastermind I'm starting in May. And I did it for six months so that we wrap up right before Thanksgiving and the holidays start kicking in. So that's what I'm creating. And yeah, if anyone is, if this sounds like right up your alley, please, we'll put a link in the show notes. You can come and find me and we can have a conversation. I am limiting this to 10 women, keeping it as intimate as I can. I love it. I love it. And, and it's so cool that it's six months, May to September, because that's just, you know, that's the most fertile time to work on ourselves, to, to, grow a garden, whatever. And it gives you that time, like between September and the new year, because in the new year, we're always, we're always looking to kind of like, okay, how do I refresh? How do I, how do I, you know, um, kind of become step into that thing that I didn't step into last year. And so there's this, like you finish in September and then you have this like integration period. And then, you know, you're going to have the new year right around the corner where you can really kind of embody that lesson from that you that you got that, those seeds you planted between May and September. So I I love that. Oh, thank you. And I find that a lot of times, you know, women really do appreciate having community and collaboration. They tend to, you know, naturally lean towards collaboration. But a lot of women and and I've and I know this because I felt it and I've expressed it and a lot of women have come to me and say they feel the same is like we really have this lack of community where we're not really feeling this kind of mentorship from another woman or feeling I've actually had clients who have been um, traumatized by women in the workplace. And so it's just really interesting because I am seeing that there is this craving for like, I want to to be able to feel like I am a contribution and that someone else has my back and that I can feel safe in this space and that we can empower each other and support each other. And so that's why I want to create this space specifically so that we can cultivate community, so that we can cultivate leadership. And this is a practice ground. It's not you come here and you listen to me for an hour. It's like, okay, this is a problem this person's having. What does it, what do we have to contribute? How can we support this person? Practicing speaking up because that, that tends to be a big thing that can happen um, is people really struggling to feel like they can voice what it is that they have to say. So yes, thank you. Yeah, no, I mean, and it's, and it's so, so many of us have, and I had a friend in LA who had like Hashimoto's and she identified um, that it was like, she was never speaking her truth. And you kind of, you know, touched on this wow. a little bit earlier, how like when we don't speak or when we don't move or when we don't like, I can't remember how you put it, but like when we don't like let ourselves out of the cage whatever that means. Mm -hmm. Like that's when this woman said, like, that's, I know that's why I got Hashimoto's. It's like, I was never speaking. Oh, wow. I was never mm -hmm. speaking. And then you mentioned like the chakra system and it's like, that's where the block mm -hmm. is. And so mm -hmm. there's all this stuff that like, I feel like, as you said, like so many times Alejandra is like, we're the first, you're the first, she's the first. And it's, and it's so true because this, especially this couple of generations before us like I don't know if it was like Great Depression World War II like there was so much stuff that just like you know just like 